morning, everyone. I'm Joanne Kuntz. Thank you for joining us today. If you're unsure, it is Tuesday, April 21st. I know the days of the week are a little bit flexible at this point in time. They are. As usual, I'm joined by Marina Parkin, my partner in Kuntz and Parkin CPAs. And today we have a very, very special, very knowledgeable guest, uh, Christine Sensenig, a labor and employment attorney that we work with frequently. So for those of you who are our clients already, we have introduced many of you to Chris. Um, she is quite the expert when it comes to all things labor and employment, including unemployment. Now, we've had lots of questions with respect to unemployment during every single one of these webinars that we've hosted. Um, unfortunately, Marina and I have continued to put our hands up and say there's no guidance and we aren't experts in this area. We're happy to report there's some guidance and now we have an expert. So um, I will continue to monitor the questions as we move along today. So if you would, please make sure that you ask any questions in the Q&A rather than in the chat box so that we can follow it. And I'll be sure to direct them to Chris as we go. Got an ad agenda laid out for you on all of the lovely topics she's gonna cover. Without further ado, Chris Sensenig. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Joanne Marina, for having me. Um, I, I get to do the standard Florida Bar disclaimer of everything we're talking about today is educational in nature. Um, I sometimes call this the blah, 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 but it's necessary. Um, <laughs> not giving legal advice, but I am telling you what we know, what we're aware of, what um, has been published, what guidance we do have, what information we have, and allow you then to be able to process that, look up some of the things yourselves, and have an idea of how this confusion system is supposed to unfold. Because the same as you've dealt with with many of the um, webinars from Marina and Joanne, which I watch regularly, um, things change and they change hourly. Um, sometimes they're changing daily, sometimes they're changing weekly, and particularly with unemployment where we still have this notion of we're working on it. Um, that's, that's kind of what we're going to talk about today a little bit of where it is they're working on it and where it is we have some certainty. So you've got the agenda up. We're going to talk about that, um, that beast known as the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity, which used to be the unemployment division, but Department of Economic Opportunity sounded better under a prior administration. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the resources available. We're going to talk about the CARES Act and a little bit about the PUC, the PUA, and the PEUC, which also dovetails into the CARES Act extension, which again is uncertain. <laughs> so lots of uncertainty. More alphabet today. soup and still more confusion. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, there, there is a lot, and at the same time, there's a lot of different pieces that, that move around and interplay with each other. And like, particularly, I mean, what do you do now with PPP money if you just got it? Um, those are the things that definitely impact people moving forward with unemployment claims and in general cause people to start to panic about now what? Because once you've gotten yourself in the system, you, you literally want to do a happy dance in your chair and go, yay, I'm in. Because there's people who've been trying for four weeks who have not gotten in. There's people who keep having to reset their um, PIN numbers. There's people who then get a notice that their identity has been stolen. There's all sorts of problems with the system, um, some of which have not quite been resolved. So, all right. So this is a really sobering number. 800,000 people have applied for reimportant. The system was never meant to handle 800,000 claims, let alone 800,000 claims in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. So when you look at 800,000 people, 121,000 votes have actually received a check from the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity. So when you do the math, and that's of course more for Maureen and Joanne to do, <laughs> it's kind of less than one check for every seven applicants. Keep in mind that the 275 a week that you can get, again, can get, hopefully from the Department of Economic Opportunity is the maximum amount you can get. The 275 used to be based on a salary of $55,000 and up. So if you are less than that, you're going to receive a portion of the 275. Now, the better number is the 23,801 people 
out of the 800 plus thousand who re have received the actual federal stimulus of $600 per week. This is really important to know because we've been waiting and waiting and this, this came out just a couple days ago that they actually have the system open and the pipeline open and the access open to the federal government under the CARES Act to be able to start getting people to their $600 a week because the less than 275 a week many people are going to make, they desperately need the $600 a week. But 23,801 people out of 800,000 isn't exactly something to cheer about. And everyone asking, well, when am I going to get my 600? <sighs> that goes back to, as we jokingly said, we get to say with great authority, it depends. Because if you are one of the 121,000 who are currently receiving checks, then you are in that <clears throat> system. The state is going to process your information to the federal government. From what we understand, and again, this is just information that is that is out there, they're processing about 25,000 applications per week. So 25,000 a week for 800,000 people, not exactly numbers we want to hear. At the same time, um, we do know that they are working on some other ways to possibly get access to that federal funding. And why that's important is because so many of the people who would necessarily be unable to access the 275, independent contractors, um, gig workers who are eligible under the CARES Act for the 600 per week are not eligible for the 275 from the state of Florida, which puts everybody into a really sticky wicket on how this is all going to end up playing out. So let's take a look at what relief the state of Florida has necessarily done, which is Governor DeSantis did sign an executive order. Um, it's 2104. Now, please note that the, the, the numbers are the numbers of executive orders he's issued. So we're at executive number 104. So when you're looking at that executive order, it's good news and bad news because this particular executive order is effective on the date it was signed, which was April 6th. So it's not a retroactive order. So everybody who applied for benefits prior to the date of that executive order on April 6th doesn't necessarily get the waiver of having to recertify their claims every two weeks. So as you can imagine out of the 800,000 plus number that I said had applied for unemployment, the majority of those had applied before April 6th. So with the April 6th number, um, everybody moving forward will not have to recertify until executive number, executive order number 2052, remember we're on executive number 104, um, expires and that date is May 8th, 2020. So when we look at the fact that that's not retroactive, Everybody prior to that date is still going to have to get into that awful system, <laughs> try to recertify their benefits, trying to put in there that every two weeks they're looking for a job. If you're in the hospitality industry, um, there are no jobs. <laughs> so the fact that you're having to say, I'm looking for a job, where are you looking for a job? And how are you saying you're going to look for a job when nobody's open to take your application? So although this is relief for people applying that day and forward, it's of no help to everybody who applied prior to, because that means you still have to recertify, you still have to put in there that you are necessarily looking for a job and that there are no jobs to be had. So people are gonna to continue to do what they've been doing, going on Indeed, going on Monster, going on Glassdoor, going on every site they can think of and, and having some sort of application for a job. Um, two of my favorites are Target and Starbucks because they always have an online application. And they're always actually looking for management, even in this day and age. So that can sometimes be a legitimate way to find a way to say these are my claims. So keep in mind that many of the executive orders being issued by Governor DeSantis all go back to the one that says 2052, because that's the one that started with the emergency benefits and it was effective for 60 days. So he's tying a lot of the expirations, including the um, non-essential medical and a few other things to that May 8th deadline. Um, we all are probably aware that Governor DeSantis had 
um, press conference yesterday talking about the reopening of Florida. He's put a task force into place. He's listed quite a few industry leaders. We don't know yet who the final members are of that task force, but why I bring that up is some of those industries, um, possibly spa, salon, possibly medical, may open earlier depending on the recommendations of that particular committee. But with unemployment, it's still tied to the May 8th, 2020 date. So I know a lot of you who are watching are very interested in knowing more about the federal benefits because a lot of you are probably independent contractors, realtors, people who support that industry. So let's go ahead and start talking about the CARES Act. So the CARES Act has three different ways that money can be accessed. The first is through the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, the PUA. The second is through the Federal Pandemic Unemployment Compensation. And the third is through the Pandemic Emergency Unemployment Compensation. Those don't matter that much to you, except for the fact that when you start getting um, federal money, the $600 a month, you will note that it will be under the program that will tell you which one you're eligible for. So each of the programs um, have their own eligibility, each have different exceptions, and they all provide for a weekly compensation benefit that will provide unemployed workers with the ability to be able to hopefully pay some of the rent, um, pay for food, pay for electric and things like that. So more importantly, most people are hoping and waiting for the $600. And that's what these, these programs are necessarily providing. It's an additional $600 that's funded by the federal government. So let's talk about necessarily how long that benefit is for. So when we look at the different ways that you can get the money, um, we look at the fact that in addition to whatever the state's going to give you, and for some of you that's nothing, uh, because again, your independent contractor is a gig worker, um, the additional $600 funded by the federal government is supposed to last through July 31st, 2020. That's where the last one, the third one comes into play is that there may be the ability to get additional weeks depending on hardship and things like that. But <laughs> that goes back to Joanne, it depends. <laughs> so so let's, let's go ahead and take a look at what each of those programs necessarily are looking at providing, which is again, the $600 a week. So when we look at unemployment related programs, you heard me talking about Governor DeSantis and the Executive Order 104. The one that I think you really need to be aware of is that Florida did waive the one week wait period. But it's important to remember to reapply and reapply and reapply. So if you are in the system and you don't see the word processing, you're not in the system. So we have some online resources. Um, we do have the ability to print a paper application if like there's one gentleman in um, West Palm Beach who had a recent news story written about him. He's a career restaurant employee. He's walking from West Palm Beach to Tallahassee <laughs> um, with a backpack and a tent trying to get attention to the fact that he has tried no fewer than 70 times to get into the system and cannot get into the system. And he's been unemployed for well over a month. So this notion of, well, there's other ways to access um, unemployment, um, there's still a sense of good luck to you with it. Um, so they did open up that separate portal for people who hadn't applied um, prior to the opening of the new portal. But even then what's happening is that that's basically a one page sheet and then you are sent to a service center where an agent will call you back. <laughs> so again, it's, it's, it's waiting, waiting, waiting. So for those of you who have not been able to get into the system, for those of you who have not gotten your PIN number, for those of you who have been repeatedly assigned a new PIN number or told to try to get into the system to get a new PIN number, one of the things that people are resorting to is printing the paper application and sending it by mail. Um, I, think that 
as a backup, I would do it. Um, if you haven't gotten any news or if you have been like some people processing for three and a half weeks um, without any other updates, without any other ability to get into the connect system, then you might want to try printing out a copy of the unemployment application via paper and then mailing it. So if it's mailed, it's then going to go to that separate processing center. And when that happens, that other group of people are going to assist with making that happen. So one of the things you need to be aware of um, politically is that the head of the Department of Economic Opportunity, Ken Lawson, was recently, um, and I'll use the words that the governor used, sidelined. And he put um, somebody else in charge because of the fact that this has been such a debacle. So that's why this notion of having paper process, electronic process, and this happening, <laughs> trying to get together, um, is, is a problem because the system just isn't able to handle this number of applications. So mistakes are being made, they don't have enough people, and even though, again, they have moved a thousand state employees to handle unemployment claims, you're dealing with a thousand people who aren't necessarily trained mm -hmm. to handle the claims, who don't know the system, and who were working in an entirely different department so I appreciate the fact that they understand at the, the state level that people desperately need help. And everybody's kind of out of patience, but having um, spoken to one or two of these folks on the phone, they're trying. They didn't cause a the problem. They're trying to help fix the problem. And they've got thousands of applications on each one of their desks that they're trying to work their way through. So my answer is reapply. Um, go ahead and, and see what you can do to get any sort of response from the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity. Because if you're stuck in that processing, processing, processing with no other information, you may just be stuck. Chris, can Which you is, again, not anything anybody wants to hear, but yes? Can you just speak briefly or clarify as to this would there was some talk early on to say that although the federal government had approved independent contractors and gig workers, that Florida hadn't caught up with that. So Correct. if you are an independent contractor, you're going to go in and get denied first. Is that what needs to happen? Well, you, you've got two different things happening there. Um, originally, I, I, Governor DeSantis expressed his frustration um, with the fact that Florida it does not have a system that's set up for independent contractors. So he didn't quite understand why the federal government said, Florida, you deal with it first. Because his answer is, we can't deal with it first. You are going to automatically be denied. So initially, they had said, go ahead and apply. Because the only way you're going to get to the federal money is to go through Florida first. Well, good luck in getting a hearing with a hearing officer on the phone to protest your denial based on the fact that Florida says you're not eligible, but the federal government says you are. So you tell me how a hearing officer has authority when they're, they're not judges, it's not a constitutional court, and they're supposed to somehow or another overrule Florida law and say federal applies. So yes, Joanne, the problem is they're supposed to be federal money. And what they were hoping for is direct access to that federal money. So we heard at Governor DeSantis' press conference on Thursday that they are setting up a system so that there can be a direct pipeline to the federal money because Florida is simply going to deny your claim. And a lot of my clients who have tried to apply as an independent contractor and they click the button it comes back, you're not eligible, and there's nothing else they can do. So they don't even know if they've been denied or not. Wow. So that's, that's problem number one. Problem number two is um, we're expecting the state of Florida to create a system in seven or 10 days <laughs> that's going to allow people to apply for federal government benefits. I don't have a lot of confidence in the success of Florida to be able to do that. But I'm hoping that with the outcry of almost a million people, because uh, the numbers continue to climb, 800,000 was the number on Sunday, um, that they will actually come up with 
some sort of direct connection to the federal government so that you don't have to sit there in the state of Florida and say, I'm not eligible, so why am I having to go through the system when if I'm not eligible, you're not going to put my application forward to the federal system anyway. Yeah. Because one of the things that came up early was that Florida said, you have to be eligible for at least a dollar of Florida unemployment for us to forward your claim to the federal government. Well, if you're an independent contractor, gig worker, you're not even eligible for the dollar. So that is still very much confusing. I don't really have good news for anybody on this particular webinar that that problem is, is going to be fixed very, very soon. Again, with the promise being made that in seven to 10 days, they're going to have a direct system to the federal government for $600. To me, that makes a whole lot more sense than putting people into the Florida system where they're deemed ineligible, where they're told nothing we can do with this application. So again, I don't even know. I do not know of any of my independent contractors or any of my self-employed um, who have gotten a denial from unemployment. Okay. And, and, and again, in order to appeal the denial, you have to get the denial. Right. So I, I, I'm hoping, I, again, I encourage everybody to watch the news daily, particularly in light of the fact that um, yesterday with the um, phone conference with um, the different chambers of commerce and with the executive um, leadership of the new task force that Governor DeSantis is convening, they are planning on every single day this week having some sort of announcement. So I keep hoping that one of those announcements is going to be um, that we now have the system up for direct access to the federal government. Because keep in mind, that happened very quickly because March 28th was the day that um, most states signed the agreement with the federal government saying, yes, we'll work with you to make sure people get the money. And today is, you know, little, little not even a month later, and people are getting money. To me, that's shocking especially in the state of Florida. I mean, the fact that 23,000 people have gotten the $600 from March 28th to Sunday is shocking. Yeah. I know it's not a good number, but that's, that's lightning speed for the state of Florida well, to get any that government, system. yeah. Yes. And you've got to yeah. think too, that all of the government agencies are having drain on the system at the same time. So it's SBA, mm -hmm. it's IRS, it's the feds, it's the state, it's the counties, it's all yeah. of these agencies are pulling at resources at the same time. Um, and so the opportunity for them to collaborate and maybe have some economies of scale to piggyback with each other, there's not time. The, it, it, exactly, and I say that a lot with all the, the regulations that have come out from the Department of Labor regarding the Families First Act, let alone, the, the like you said, the other information from IRS, which piggybacks onto that regarding, here's your credit here, here's your credit there, here's no credit here. I'm amazed they've been able to do what they've done. And again, in, in really, really yeah. lightning speed for We've been the government. telling folks, you know, it's, I know you're still frustrated individually because you don't personally have help. Um, mm -hmm. But when you think about even with PPP, the SBA wrote $20 billion of loans in 2019 and they did 350 billion in 14 days. They did 14 years worth of loans in 14 days. It's not perfect. The system is far from flawless. Um, well, it is it, remarkable. It, yeah, and, 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 and again, the, the notion that Florida's unemployment system has been broken for a while is, is frankly one we've known for a while. Mm -hmm. And why that's, you know, it just hasn't gotten fixed. Yeah. So with this many people now saying it needs to be fixed, well, resources are going that way. And, and let's go back to $17 million was spent less than a week yeah. to help get those systems running. And so you know again, what, it's going to happen at the local business level too. People are going to look inside their own businesses and say, you know what, I know we were weak on systems and procedures. I know we were weak in our billing or collection process. I know we were weak here. And businesses are going to strengthen as a result of being put to the test here. Those that survive are going to have to strengthen in order, you know, to, to, to flourish and to, to thrive. So, mm -hmm. so. and, and, a lot of people are discovering, particularly with PPP, with unemployment, with reducing people to part-time wages, with furloughs and all of that, that all of a sudden what they thought was a clear policy is not. Yeah. The notion of who's exempt and non-exempt under the Fair Labor Standards Act, 
Well, that's become a really big deal because people are furloughing people midweek and not realizing that could destroy salary basis. Um, they're changing salaried people to hourly people. They've just destroyed their basis. There's all sorts of things that, that happen that, that we do because we have to. Mm -hmm. And then later we look at it and go, maybe we might get a better system in place for that. So I agree with you, Joanne. I think that the agencies are looking mm -hmm. and particularly Florida with the Department of Economic Opportunity, which has always been a, a difficult system. It's never been particularly um, robust as they like to say. And let's be real, 275 a week. Yeah. For somebody making $55,000 a year, it was, it, you know, that's, that's a major disincentive to be on unemployment. Yeah. So 275 a week is, is not something that they're talking about raising. Let's keep that in mind. And most importantly, and I think we've got this in one of the other slides, is this notion of retroactivity. Mm -hmm. I don't see it happening. Um, you may have applied on March 1st from employment benefits and you may be stuck in that processing system. That doesn't mean your benefits start on March 1st. Your, your 12 weeks of unemployment benefits start on the day you get the check. Mm -hmm. They don't go backwards. Okay. So even though we've gotten a little bit of progress, um, we've gotten some of our, you know, our, our federal and state senators saying, we really do need to look at this. We really do need to look at this. Where is the budget for it to happen? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not a lack of compassion. It's a lack of where we get the money. But at the same time, they're starting to realize that the 275 a week is, is maybe woefully inadequate. Yeah. And we have heard nothing that the federal government's going to make the $600 a week retroactive either. So let's go back to that notion of you applied on March 1st. You haven't gotten anything yet. Next week, you get your 275 from Florida. You get your 600 from the feds. That's it going forward. You're not getting the $600 a week back to March. And so then as, this, as things start to open up with the prospect that Florida particularly could be opening May 1st or May 8th or whatever uh, parts date in between, then people are going to just only get that benefit for a certain period of time. When, How do you know when that goes away? Is it when you get your job back? Is there a certain number of hours or a certain dollar figure that is the trigger for that? And, and, and that, that's a really good question because in the state of Florida, the 275 a week, is, is what they are measuring your wages against. So if you were a full-time employee um, working 40 hours a week, and now you are a somebody making 20 hours a week, um, and you're making 300 a week instead of 600 a week, um, you're making more than 275, which means you're not eligible in the state of Florida for 275. But Joanne, here's at least a bit of good news out <laughs> of the federal government. If you have been reduced and if you are now a part-time worker, you are eligible for the kick-in of the 600, even though under Florida, you're not. So that goes back to, well, great. I was full-time at 40 hours, making 600 a week. Now I'm making 300 a week at 20 hours. I make more than 275. How do I get into that federal system? Because Florida is going to say, denied, yeah. you are not eligible. So again, back to these seven to 10 days, back to the fact that if you do get a denial saying you made too much money for Florida to kick in, but you know, we recognize you've had a, here's the language they use, a material and substantial change in the terms and conditions of your employment. Yep, 24 years of practice of law, I can say that. <laughs> so, um, Thank you, Sally May. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, so with that whole notion of that part-time work that a lot of employers are going to start offering their employees because as medical practices open up, as dental practices open up, um, as, as some of the other things in the economy open up, they might not be able to bring back the workforce um, in, in full, at full time, but they will be able to bring back part-time people, which brings me to a really, really important issue. If your employer is offering you work and you turn it down because it's not enough work, you are then not going to be eligible for benefits. It's, are you ready, willing, and able to work? Is work available for you and to you? Now, that notion of, but my employer offers me 20 hours a week, I used to have 40 hours a week, I can't live off 300, and frankly, I was living off 275 plus the 600, which is 875. Remember that under the federal plan, they are supposed to still kick in for part-time employment. That was part of the CARES Act, independent contractors, gig workers, people seeking part-time work. So if you've been offered part-time work, you're still going to have to seek 
part-time work based on how the federal government still seems to be talking about that plan, which goes back to with Florida now talking about creating that separate portal, that separate system, are you then still going to have to certify that you're looking for work or is the federal system going to be entirely different? And that is a complete unknown. But do know that if you're an employer and you're offering part-time work, your employee can't say, nah, it's easier for me to be on unemployment because that's turning down available work. Gotcha. So those, those are some really big issues. And I've, I've heard a lot from employers on why well, have employees who don't want to come back to work. But if you have work available for them, then they kind of have to. Now, again, if you have five hours of work, well, if they have no hours of work, the government's still going to expect them to take that five hours of work. Yeah. So just a quick, being furloughed means that you're still on the payroll. It means you get zero income, you get zero wages, but you're still technically on the payroll such that you should be eligible for benefits for at least the month of April. If not in the month of May, we're still waiting on some guidance on that. And the reason people are furloughed is to be able to be reactivated. So let's go back to those medical dental practices where they know May 8th or possibly sooner, they should be reopened. Well, they're not going to be reopened to 7,000 people in their waiting room. So they're still going to probably have a staggered return to work. Mm -hmm. So furlough is particularly good for people who you know you're going to have to reactivate. The word furlough is not used in the unemployment site. It is temporary layoff is the word that they use. And too many people say I was laid off when they mean they were fired. And that's a big deal because if you were terminated, you are entitled to the benefits. If you are furloughed and then brought back part-time basis um, and you turn it down, that's, that's a different story. And do remember, everyone's employer receives a copy of what you submitted because they are supposed to confirm it. Which is another reason why I know so many of the people who applied, even back in early March, their application's nowhere because the employer hasn't gotten the confirmation of it yet. And the employer's checking in regularly. They're going onto their Connect system and going, there's no applications here for us to confirm. So, yeah, kind of a broken system. Wow. All right. Yeah, well, let's... It's, it's beyond frustrating. It's, it's disturbing to say the least. So this is the one I was telling you about that if you have not yet filed a claim, you can use this kind of side um, and run around the system, which is where you fill out a very, very short one page document and then a processor will call you to fill out the rest of it. This is apparently happening quickly. The people are being called in two to three days and that their applications are then showing as processing. So if you haven't applied yet, if, if you were furloughed last week, if you were terminated last week, this may be the better system for you to use because it seems to be happening faster. Okay. So this is the thing that again, Florida does not include, but the CARES Act explicitly included independent contractors and gig workers who are not eligible to apply for unemployment in many states. And that's how they do it in many states, but that through the federal system, they are. So again, Florida is not alone in this. Most states don't allow independent contractors or gig workers. Um, and again, when you think of gig, you think of Uber, you think of TaskRabbit, you think of those sort of platforms that are driven by software that you put, this is a service I want and somebody who's a member of that software service goes, and I will give it to you for this price. So the CARES Act made sure that even though the states don't have it, that the federal government said, we do. Now, like Joanne was saying, <laughs> we've had how many days since March 28th to get all this into place to create this whole new infrastructure. I know that, again, as you're sitting there unemployed and going, I don't have my check, that doesn't make you feel any better. But it is a matter of the systems aren't in place, they're working on it. And considering, again, today is Tuesday, Governor DeSantis's press conference was Thursday. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, five of the seven to 10 days that he said would it take to get that system up and running for direct access to federal government have passed. So that's why I'm saying, please keep an eye on the news for that. Um, he, Governor DeSantis has his own website and it's, it's helpful to watch because he has a whole COVID section. You can check on it, you can look at it. 
And again, most of the time when the governor, president, any of our senators have a press conference, it's carried widely on the news. And I know most of us don't want to sit through 35 minutes of, of politicians talking, but afterwards you can usually find the summary of the snippets that matter to you, such as when, again, that same press conference where Governor DeSantis says schools are closed for the rest of the year. So God save all the parents on this call. <laughs> Because um, homeschooling is, is like, ah! <laughs> homeschooling is not easy. And, and I think out of this, a lot of people will have a whole lot new appreciation for teachers and daycare workers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no one will be complaining about the supplies list next year. You want, <laughs> so, you want scissors? We're bringing them in droves. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you need. <laughs> I, I think cases of alcohol might necessarily be in order. <laughs> oh, boy. So this is where it again is a problem. Uh, we already know that the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity says independent contractors, <laughs> and realtors, gig county workers are ineligible. So even if you did get an application in process and you haven't gotten your denial yet, and again, I don't know of anyone who's gotten one. And I know people who've applied who are self-employed because they, they said, well, the system keeps telling me I'm not eligible and it kicks me out. Well, it's not giving you the denial you need to be able to then possibly appeal that denial or at least seek to appeal that denial. But I keep hoping again, five more days, five more days. Oops. And that's again, if we can depend on what it was done. So this is, this is the whole notion of what um, federal government programs are giving you the benefits. So we already know under this particular portion of the act, Florida is notoriously stingy, 275 a week. And again, that's up to a maximum of 275 a week. And that you will then receive the eventual supplemental payment from the federal government. Each week, the employee and the worker is unemployed or partially unemployed, which again, is good because they meant for part-time workers to be able to get benefits while before it really wasn't part of the intent. So, Keep in mind the $600 supplement payment is to be provided through July 31st, 2020. And that if you're receiving sick leave, vacation pay, bonus payments, any sort of paid leave benefits, you will not be eligible for the full weekly benefits during the time that you are receiving those contributions. So we don't know what that means for the federal $600. Um, we do know what it means for Florida, that they will you know, zero you out possibly, um, or give you, you know, at a client, I got $11. <laughs> it's like, I don't even know what to say to that. Why did you even bother a stamp to send me $11? But with this notion of the $600, we keep hearing from Congress, we meant $600. We meant to give you $600. Then I've also heard the phrase up to $600. So most people I know, who gotten the $600, um, they got $600. But those same individuals I know are fully and completely unemployed because they're in the hospitality industry. So employees who are working reduced hours must report their earnings because again, your employer will as well. So if you are working 20 hours a week instead of 40, earning 300, your employer must report that if you get a bonus payment from your employer because they're worried about the fact that you haven't gotten your unemployment payment, or frankly, it was the one you earned back in February and they're paying it to you now, um, you have to report that as well. So that can get tricky and you may wanna call your employer to find out what period of time that bonus was for, because even though it may be showing up on this paycheck, you could still make an argument, well, that was my February money. It wasn't my money for this week. It was the money I'd earned in November, December, and January. So again, your employer will out you on this, that if you refuse available work or fail to return to work, they're going to have to tell that to the Department of Economic Opportunity. It's not a matter if they don't want you to get the money, but the same as you, they are signing under oath and penalty of perjury that what they're saying is true and accurate. So the pandemic unemployment assistance provides benefits for individuals who have exhausted their Florida benefits, um, so for instance, you've reached your maximum, I think it's 12.2 weeks of 275 a week, then you have the ability to get this portion of the benefits under the CARES Act. So again, considering most people are getting their first check, maybe second check, 
this is this is 10 weeks away from being any sort of reality and of course what the federal and state government is hoping is that there will be a reopening of, of sorts such that this won't necessarily come into play um, i have to believe that for the real estate industry and for the dining hospitality industry this will come into play because of course we're about to be in slow season right <laughs> so that that notion of season yeah we, we had season cut short to say the least mm -hmm. and now we're running into you know the dog days of, of of summer with it being entirely too hot people not wanting to come and you know the notion of people being worried about travel mm -hmm. such that they're not going to necessarily get on planes now they'll drive but when we look at what it is that they're trying to give guidance about the department of labor again has been amazing in, in its ability to put out guidance but they want to make sure that independent contractors or self-employed people individuals who work in part-time and individuals who otherwise would not qualify will get the benefits under the pua so again when you get checks when you get information from the federal government it will reference the different acts under cares under which you're getting this money mm -hmm. so that way you, you kind of have an idea because like i said there's that one tag on for hardship that's supposed to go on for another 13 weeks and i have the feeling that a lot of self-employed and people in the, the real estate industry are going to be needing access to that additional money because one of the things they brought up in um the task force meeting on the reopen florida thing was that you know how much of a percentage of florida's economy depends on real estate but how many people actually are employed in real estate is is, is a different issue now can you address something for us chris as you know a lot of our clients who are independent contractors of any sort be they consultants or realtors or anything um we always advise them to have a corporate structure so we we would say be an llc so that they can take advantage of some tax benefits by being taxed as an S corporation. If that is your circumstance, would they be making the unemployment application as Joanne Koontz or would it be Joanne Koontz LLC that's the, make, that's the applicant for any of these programs? And honestly, Joanne, that's gonna depend on what the federal government direct portal is going to say. Okay. Because their answer was self-employed. And keep in mind, the state of Florida does not require you to incorporate. If you, if you are just one person. Mm -hmm. Yes, we all know there's a bunch of tax reasons why you should, right. <laughs> um, but not everyone does that. So um, out, outside of your usual realm, think of all the people who clean houses, who have not gotten an LLC, an INC, mm -hmm. anything like that, but who pay, pay taxes, you know, re report it. They're going to do it under their social security number. Sure. Um, again, what the federal government is going to tell us on that, we don't know yet. So we're, we're still looking at it from, don't know what to say, but again, in, in the state of Florida, the application has a, you know, are you self-employed box? <laughs> or are you an officer of your company? So if you're self-employed, the answer to that is yes. And as soon as well, you, you check that box, this, this other box comes up that says you are ineligible for benefits in the state of Florida. And the answer is, but I'm not on the federal level. Then would you say that if I did have Joanne Coons LLC, do I apply Joanne Coons the individual and name my employer as my personal LLC? Or if I'm a realtor, would I say it's Remax or Sotheby's or my brokerage that's my employer if I'm a realtor? Well, but but again, if you're self-employed, that's not your employer. So it's not going to be. It's just going to be me. Right. Okay. Exactly. And that, that, that's a good question. Because again, when you're self-employed, that is who you're engaged by, not who you're employed by. Gotcha. Uh, Chris, does that answer change at all if you are actually taking a W-2 as the employee from your own company? Um, you're still self-employed because you're an officer of the company. Okay. So again, for PPP purposes, as long as you are getting a wage from the company salary, you could use that. Mm -hmm. But if you're the only person getting a wage, um, then you are technically going to be, for purposes of the federal government plan, self-employed. For Florida, ineligible, because you're an officer of the company. I still remember the first time I realized I had to pay into the system and could never get any money out of it. <laughs> Welcome to America. <laughs> of course, I was like, I'll 
fire myself, <laughs> but it didn't quite work out. <laughs> so, but you know, to qualify, you have to demonstrate that you are available for work. So if you've had somebody who had um, a work comp accident and they are not currently able to work because their doctor said you can't work, they're not eligible for unemployment benefits because you must be willing, able and available for work. Okay. And the second part, even though it sounds like, oh, how am I gonna do that? Um, you have to establish that your unemployment, partial unemployment, or your inability to work is being caused by COVID-19 reasons. The, we aren't quite certain as to what they're going to want for that, but I have the feeling it's gonna be the same as the PPP application where it said the uncertainty related to the economy um, causes me to file this application. So I can't imagine it's gonna be a, a, a very draconian, very, I know for certain this is because of COVID. Well, again, um, you, you don't have to be you know, a statistician or an actuary to take a look at the information being published by the Florida Chamber of Commerce, by the various universities on what's happening to the Florida economy. So again, you have to report your earnings each week to avoid an overpayment, to avoid being deemed ineligible, and to avoid the state of Florida possibly going after you for fraud. Nobody wants that because that's actually a crime, even under unemployment, which is not, again, a constitutional court. <laughs> not a court at all. It's an administrative agency. Okay. So when we look at some of the other benefits that could be available. This is what I was talking about, is provides up to 13 weeks, up to 13 weeks of benefits who've exhausted their regular unemployment compensation under Florida or federal. And this particular right is, I think, I want to make sure I can do that. Um, it's going to be through the last day of December because that's when the Florida Families First Act, the CARES Act, all of it sunsets. And we all know that there could be a resurgence of, of COVID, as well as the fact that, you know, if there is, they're going to close the dining rooms, they're going to close the things that they've opened. Um, for, for, for many of us, you know, we've realized how essential um, our hairstylists really are. <laughs> so, and the fact that they cannot in any way, you know, six feet be able to do our hair. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to find moments of levity um, throughout this, but I appreciate the fact that the government, kind of like they did with the emergency unemployment back in 2008, 2009, where they had the separate um, avenue that you could get additional benefits for. So you've got basically 12.2 weeks available from the state of Florida. If you're still unemployed and you're gonna meet the criteria of the pandemic emergency unemployment compensation, you have up to an additional 13 weeks of benefits. And again, what's that benefit? $600 a week. It's not the Florida 275 a week. This is dealing with the pandemic. So therefore it's the additional $600 a week. So even though you may have exhausted your 275 or portion thereof, you will still be able to possibly get the $600 for an additional 13 weeks if you're able to meet the, what they're basically saying is hardship. But again, if your restaurant's closed, I don't see how you're not gonna meet hardship. Mm -hmm. If there's nobody buying real estate, I don't see how you're not going to meet a hardship. So again, this is still very much contingent upon the state of Florida getting that separate system going so that you can directly apply for benefits because if you're self-employed, you're, you're not gonna have any access through Florida anyway. So there is that, you know, they may be eligible for up to 39 weeks in most states. Um, how many of you believe that's going to be true in Florida? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd say no to that. But again, we wanted to give you kind of an overview of what could happen. I do not see the state of Florida doing that. I just don't. Um, I know that uh, New York, New Jersey, Oregon, California um, are already saying that this is this is going to be eligible, but as I jokingly say, California is a different country when it comes to their laws. So can use that as a benchmark. Yeah. And, and again, I mean they pay the taxes for it too. So um, but but again, I would not count on this for the state of Florida in any way, shape, or form. But you know, keep in mind that 
trying to get people on the phone is, is mostly an exercise and, and frustration if you're trying to get through to um, the Department of Economic Opportunity. I, I know that people need the money. Um, I know the delays are horrendous. And I know saying, well, let's hope in another five days, Florida gets the system up and going so you can directly you know, get that pipeline to the $600 when you know you applied back in march and we're in mid to late april and you don't have any certainty at all so there's no doubt about it and that's also where i do think that um, the politicians are hearing us and and considering 17 million dollars was spent in a week to try and get the systems up and running considering that um, the head of the Department of Economic Opportunity was sidelined and the tech guy from emergency management was brought over. And lo and behold, look what happened. A thousand people switched over. All of a sudden they're, they're committing to at least 25,000 applications a week. And if they can get some of the other things they want to do to the system that they've talked about, um, they're gonna be able to process 50 to 75,000 applications in a week. Wow. Considering that a thousand people are working on those applications, that's at least an indication that you're being heard, that something needs to be done. So last but not least, the $600 a week um, from the feds is coming in a paper check. Okay. It, is, it is not being direct deposited. Um, everyone I know who's gotten one has said paper check. I know that they have the ability to possibly send you a debit card. No one has gotten one yet. Um, that goes back to what Joanne said earlier of these agencies are working really fast. Their ability to hire a vendor to create those vendor cards and get them ready is, is a whole lot different than going over to the treasury and going through the checks. Mm -hmm. So, but paper checks are, are what are being issued by the feds. Okay. We have a so question. If, Go ahead, Marina. Uh, so if Florida does not have the 39 week, but feds do in- No, 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 no the, the, the feds don't, no, that's states. That's okay. The feds have an additional 13 weeks. Okay, I understand. Okay. So if you're applying, but you're applying through Florida, so if you if you are in the system then and you are getting it, you will be entitled to that additional $600 a week. You should be. Again, it goes back to what we did back in 2008, where Florida didn't have 12 weeks in 2008, but even then the 24 weeks I believe we had in Florida at that time, you still were able to get another 24 weeks from the federal government, even though Florida didn't offer them. It, it's kind of, again, the, the federal emergency unemployment round two. <laughs> so it, it, that's why it's so important that we get that portal to the federal government because after 12.2 weeks in Florida, you're done. You've exhausted your benefit and there's nothing else Florida will do for you. But there should be that additional 13 weeks under the, the PEUCA um, part of the program where you can fill out the hardship papers, and if you've already got the federal system going and there's already going to be that, by that point, the portal that you can apply directly, then you should be able to continue to get that 13 weeks in addition to the 12. Can you talk us through, Chris? Um, we've had a lot, helped a lot of people apply for PPP and or IDLE. Um, does that make them ineligible for unemployment? Can you talk about the timing of sure. if I got my PPP funds, should I wait? 12, you know, eight weeks to go run and get unemployment, what's? A absolutely, and, and that's one of the things that the Department of Labor has certainly been trying to give us some guidance on. Yeah. And over and over again, we, we hear the phrase from um, Department of Labor of no double dipping. Yeah. So if you got PPP, you are then responsible for making sure your employees are paid eight weeks at their full salary. So if they previously received unemployment, that's fine because the PPP starts the day that the loan you sign for it. So at that point, anybody on an unemployment needs to be told, oh, you're back to work. So they, again, you, you certify in arrears. So they would say, I was unemployed Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I went back to work Thursday, Friday, which we all know means you're not going to get any money from the state of Florida um, because you're going to probably make more than the 275. But you cannot have people on unemployment at the same time you're getting the PPP funds. Now, again, if they were getting it prior to you reactivating them to turn, return to work for eight weeks, they're allowed to keep that money. They will just need the next time that they're going to certify that I'm receiving wages of blank. 
because remember the employer is also going to get the confirmation of the employee said that they were employed and you're like, oh yes, they were. I have PPP, I'm paying them. Nobody wants to be in, in, in that problem. So this also, Joanne, is a good time for you to have that communication with your employees on we've received the PPP, you're going to get your full wages. Please know that you're ineligible for unemployment during this time. And we of course have to confirm anything that you said to unemployment and we will confirm that we have PPP and you're being paid your full salary. So that people aren't confused because there is a lot of confusion out there. I, I'm not ascribing sinister motives to anybody. They just don't understand because a lot of people are about to be paying their employees to not work. Let's, let's be honest. A lot of people don't have the work. So if you've got PPP and you're a restaurant and you are doing takeout curbside only, that staff of 40 is a staff of nine. Yeah. So what are those other 31 people doing? They're being paid to do social media at home. <laughs> so, so they may look at it and say, I'm not employed. Well, you are, you're receiving your full paycheck. I've just reassigned your job. Okay. I am assuming this works also if the loan is an idle loan versus PPP because that's still federal government money or is that a little different? It, it, it may be a little different. It may be a little different because under PPP, you must, in order to be eligible for it, say you're using it for salary. Um, idle isn't just for salary. So if you're getting idle and PPP, I know that they're taking $10,000 off of your PPP and saying, you know, you don't get to have both of those right. as contributing toward salary. So I know this is probably going to be a question the two of you are going to get from a lot of your clients on tax wise, what am I supposed to be doing here? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go back one other step to the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which has that whole dollar for dollar tax credit for people mm -hmm. who are taking the leave under emergency mm -hmm. paid sick leave or the emergency FMLA plus. You don't get to say, well, I'm paying them their salary under PPP mm -hmm. and I'm going to take the two weeks of their regular wages and get the dollar for dollar tax credit. And this is where, Joanna Marina, you're going to have a lot of questions mm -hmm. and have to change a lot of people's tax returns because they don't know what they should be doing at the moment. Yeah. Again, I'm not saying anyone's doing it. Yeah, that's a, uh, I, a I feel like that's kind of the next, the next wave. Definitely. Yeah, and, and, and again, as, as the information continues to um, be distributed, again, Department of Labor has been really busy. Um, you know, in, in, in a period of three weeks, they issued 80 plus um, frequently asked question answers. That's a lot to have done in conjunction with IRS guidelines, which of course you guys have read on how you document um, someone's leave under the Families First Act. So could you technically have somebody who is back to work getting PPP funds full salary who then comes to you and says, by the way, <laughs> I have to take two weeks off because I just got a coronavirus um, diagnosis. Then what are we gonna do? <laughs> so, but again, if you're paying them their full salary through PPP, you then don't get the dollar for dollar. The answer is they get it to stay home. So that's some of the guidance we've got from DOL on you, you don't piggyback them. It's, it's one or the other. So for the self-employed people, Chris, what is your advice at the moment until that system is up and running? Should they apply and get denied or wait? Really? Based, what based on what Governor DeSantis just said on Thursday about them trying to get that system up and based on him saying, and I don't know if it was a hot mic moment or what, <laughs> but I don't understand what we're supposed to do this. They're not eligible in Florida. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, that was his expressing his frustration on what am I supposed to do with these applicants? Because again, mm -hmm. if you click officer of the company, you're not getting a denial. So if you're an officer of the company, there's no reason to be trying to get through that system because they're not issuing a denial anyway. So in light of the fact that it's supposed to be five more days, um, I, I would recommend waiting rather than trying, if you're, again, if you're an officer of your company, if you are, you know, self-employed, um, and not necessarily having the, the structure in place to keep the rest of your assets protected and you're just cleaning houses, um, you might as well apply because you're not an officer of a company or they're going to deem you ineligible so that if Governor DeSantis says, if you were in the system and denied because you were self-employed, we're still going to process your application. You don't want to have missed that opportunity. 
Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of uh, majority of our clients that are self-employed have a structure in place. It doesn't matter how it's taxed, but they most of them are under the LLC structure. So mm -hmm. I think that probably the advice on waiting at least another five days would probably be prudent, Joanne. Especially with, you know, when you announce to the world, it's going to be ready in seven to 10 days. Um, and you've already had major disasters with unemployment. You've already had, you know, the not only the public outcry, but every single one of your people in the House and Senate calling you and going, um, yeah, the constituents are lined up outside my door. What are we doing? They, they have at least responded. Was it a slow response? Yes. <laughs> Could it have been faster? Of course. Um, but now that we have their attention, we mm -hmm. seem to really have their attention. Chris, we can't thank you enough. I want to be respectful of your time. We asked you for an hour, so we don't want to make you uh, stay too long in hopes that maybe you'll come back as more information with this. I'd be, I'd be happy to. Again, as, as it unfolds, I mean, yeah. I, I just spend every waking moment looking at my screen. Going, what are they coming out with? Because again, By the existence we have now, waiting on yes. executive it, orders. <laughs> it is, and, and especially, again, with the fact that... Um, I've, I've had the privilege of working with so many good clients who care very much about what's happening to their staff. Yeah. And they want to be able to send out email blasts and tell them this is what's happening. Here's mm -hmm. this, here's that. And especially with people who four weeks later still don't have a check. I mean, I have clients who are going into reserves and loaning people money yeah. because mm -hmm. they want to do the right thing. Nobody wanted people to go a month without pay. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're watching this carefully. Everyone's paying attention. We know that it's really important that people keep their people employed yeah. as long as they can and keep them informed. Yeah. You know, it's one, I guess, silver lining to this whole process is you saw lots of people, you know, very divided over political issues and social issues and things like that, even on social media, just casually people arguing. And now you see, you know, feeding healthcare workers and lots of people in the community coming together and picking people up and shopping for elderly yeah. neighbors. And it does kind of uh, restore your faith in humanity a bit. So it's nice it, to it see is. that there are employers that are super concerned about their employees. You know, oftentimes I'm sure you feel your fair share um, of employee gripes about mm -hmm. employers and employer gripes about employees and kind of to see everybody just really, I've seen friends of mine that are in the restaurant industry who are, mm -hmm you know, servers that are valiantly defending their owner saying, I know he's trying to keep us safe and do take yeah. out and let them deliver and do things that they otherwise wouldn't be able to do. It's really refreshing to see some positive. And, and again, I, I do think that when we are able to see doors opening again, um, there's a lot of loyal employees out there who yes. are, are really going to be appreciated by their employer in new ways. And, and again, the same way of, of watching what the employers are doing to keep them informed. And even if it's the email saying, you know, we talked to the lawyer today, here's the separate portal for unemployment. Here's how you can print an application. If you know you need me to print it and mail it to you, I'll do that. I'm, I'm seeing those sort of things happening because mm -hmm. not everybody does have access to a printer or a system that allows them to print. So we're seeing, you know, like you said, this two-way street of, of people trying to do what they can. And it's it. It does at times restore faith in humanity <laughs> as, as we all sit there and jokingly get dressed up to pick up our mail and take out our trash. Because <laughs> True. Otherwise, you know, it, it's, it's the notion of, well, what's like you said, what's today? Yeah. What's the day today? It's, it's all the same. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Chris. Again, for those of you who attended, if you need to reach out to Christine for your business, we'll be providing her contact details to you along with the copy of the recording. Those things are always available on our website, on our YouTube channel, and on our Facebook pages as well. Um, if you have questions, we're here to help. We'll continue to chop on these and provide the information as it unfolds. It's, it's our job. So stay tuned. If you have questions, make sure you email us if there's other topics you wanna hear. Please keep us posted. And thanks again to Chris for all of your time. We it, was, it was my pleasure. It's always a pleasure to work with Joanne and Marina. <laughs>